In the growth and settlement of the western United States, few developments were more important than the building of the railroad system that linked a rich and wild land to its inevitable destiny, the Oregon and California Railroad. The Oregon and California Railroad was formed from the Oregon Central Railroad when it was the first to operate a 20-mile stretch south of Portland in 1869. This qualifies the railroad for land grants in California, whereupon the name of the railroad soon changed to Oregon and California Railroad Company. In 1887, the line was completed over Siskiyou Summit, and the Southern Pacific Railroad assumed control of the railroad, although it was not officially sold to Southern Pacific until January 3, 1927. As part of the U.S. government's desire to foster settlement and economic development in the western states, in July 1866, Congress passed the Oregon and California Railroad Act, which made 3,700,000 acres of land available for a company that built a railroad from Portland, Oregon to San Francisco. Distributed by the state of Oregon in 12,800 acre land grants for each mile of track completed. Two companies, both of which named themselves the Oregon Central Railroad, began a competition to build the railroad, one on the west side of the Willamette River and one on the east side. The two lines would eventually merge and reorganize as the Oregon and California Railroad. In 1869, Congress changed how the grants were to be distributed requiring the railroads to sell land along the line to settlers in 160-acre parcels at $2.50 per acre. The purpose of these restrictions was to encourage settlement and economic development while compensating the ONC Railroad for its costs of construction. Construction efforts were sporadic, finally reaching completion in 1887 after the financially troubled ONC Railroad was acquired by the Southern Pacific. The land was distributed in a checkerboard pattern, with selections laid out for 20 miles on either side of the rail corridor, with the government retaining the alternate sections for future growth. By 1872, the railroad had extended from Portland to Roseburg. Along the way, it created growth in Willamette Valley towns such as Canby, Aurora, and Harrisburg, which emerged as freight and passenger stations and provided a commercial lifeline to the part of the river valley above Harrisburg where steamships were rarely able to travel. As the railroad made its way into the Umpqua Valley, new town sites such as Drain, Oakland, and Yonkala were laid out. From about 1870 to 1888, ferry service connected downtown Portland to the East Portland Terminal. The original ferry service, established by Ben Holliday, was near the present-day location of the Steel Bridge. In 1879, Henry Villard put the O and C R R ferry number two into service near the present-day location of the Burnside Bridge. While construction was still ongoing, multiple charges of land fraud arose. The company was accused of rounding up individuals from saloons in Portland's waterfront district and paying them to sign applications to purchase 160-acre parcels of ONC land as settlers then selling these fraudulent instruments in large blocks to corporate interests through corrupt middlemen. This elaborate money laundering and land fraud scheme was only the beginning. Southern Pacific Railroad eventually abandoned the pretense of non-existent settlers and sold lands in large parcels directly to developers for as much as $40 per acre. By 1902, with land pricing soaring, the company declared it was terminating land sales altogether. When the scandal broke in 1904 through an investigation by the Oregonian, it had grown to such a magnitude that the paper reported that more than 75% of the land sales had violated federal law. Newly elected President Theodore Roosevelt, as part of his plan of progressive reforms, vowed in 1903 to clean up the ONC land fraud mess once and for all. Over the following two years, Roosevelt's investigators collected evidence and over a thousand politicians, businessmen, railroad executives, and others were indicted. Many were eventually tried and convicted on charges including fraud, bribery, and other corruption. 
The federal government sought return of the grant lands from the railroad not partially part of the right-of-way for the railroad line itself. The U.S. Supreme Court decided that the railroad had been built as promised, so the railroad company should not be forced to completely forfeit the lands despite having violated the terms of the grant. Congress responded in 1916 with the Chamberlain-Ferris Act. This law put the ONC lands back in the U.S. federal government control and compensated the company at an amount equivalent to what it would have received had it abided by the $2.50 per acre limit. Counties with ONC land also received revenue from timber and land sales to make up for the loss of local and state taxation revenue from the land. The law was modified in 1926 by the Stanfield Act. By 1937, ONC Act, and most recently by the Secure Rural Schools and Community Self-Determination Act of 2000, which has been renewed several times and includes other rural counties in the United States. As timber revenues of the ONC lands have declined over the years, counties have faced financial difficulty as they struggle to fill the revenue gap. The Oregon and California Railroad revested lands, known as the ONC lands, lie in a checkerboard pattern throughout 18 counties of western Oregon. These lands contain more than 2.4 million acres of forest with the diversity of plant and animal species, recreation areas, mining claims, grazing lands, cultural and historical resources, scenic areas, wild and scenic rivers, and wilderness. The Oregon and California Railroad lands continue to be a unique public trust. Credit, he never had a rack.